Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Duchess Marmet. We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Hey, Stephanie, can you believe that the average mass produced bottle of wine can contain up to 16 grams of added sugar? I know that's crazy. That's more than a glazed donut. Oof, she kind of grosses me out. But anyway, we're so excited because we finally found clean crafted wine that we enjoy, that tastes good, and we don't feel like crap the next day. I am loving these Scout and Cellar wines. We've tried several of the different types and all of them taste good, like Marnie said. And we love the fact that there's no added sugar. They're free of chemicals and pesticides. They're grown with organic grapes and sustainable farming practices. And they have very low sulfites, which are one of the things that can often cause the headaches the next day. And, you know, it's summertime, it's patio season. It's so nice to just get outside. If you enjoy having a glass of wine, um, we are super excited to be part of Scout and Cellar. And we do have our online shop. So you just head on over to www.scoutandcellar. That's S-C-O-U-T-A-N-D. C-E-L-L-A-R dot com slash the art of living well. You can have clean crafted wine delivered to your door. Hello and welcome to episode 39 of the Art of Living Well podcast. Today we are absolutely thrilled to bring you our guest, Karen Hurd. She is a nutritionist, a biochemist. She's been practicing for over 30 years and she also holds her master's degree in biochemistry. Her philosophy is really about approaching health, kind of like Hippocrates did, the father of modern medicine, when he said, let food be thy medicine and thy medicine be food. Karen really applies her knowledge at the biomolecular level to really understand the cause of health problems we face and what dietary and lifestyle changes are needed to correct that cause and unlock our best health. She has been working in nutrition for over 30 years. She's helped 30,000 people, and she has e-courses. Her company is called Karen Heard Nutrition, and she's just so knowledgeable, and she has some powerful stories to share with us. So we're really excited to have her here with us today. And we just have one more request before we start our conversation today. We would love it if you would head on over to Apple Podcasts and give us a rating and a review. It helps our search capabilities so much more and our podcast grow. So we would greatly appreciate if you enjoy listening to the podcast, if you would give us a rating and a review. Thank you so much. Karen, we are so happy to have you on our podcast today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to talk with us. Um, I had mentioned this to you earlier, but I found you through another podcast, Lacey Phillips Expanded Podcast in December. I listened to your episode, I think it was called like Healing Through Food, Um, And I was so moved by your story, which I'm going to ask you to share on the air today, that I just usually I don't listen to long podcasts in one, um, you know, drive or whatever. But I was walking on the beach and I just I couldn't bring myself to go back to the hotel until the episode was over. And I think I was tearful um, during that episode at different moments in time. And I just I immediately sent it to Stephanie. And I was like, we have to have this woman on our podcast at some point. So anyway, very thankful you're here. Um, We would love to have you start out by sharing a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. 
And we'd love for you to share your personal experience with your daughter and her health journey and how you healed her through food and how that kind of led you down your path to your career. Well, well, I guess that's just to start at the beginning. A long time ago, I went to school and did fine in high school, graduated to the top of my class and decided I'm going to study Spanish against my father's recommendation. He's smarter than I am, but you know how you are when you're 18, you graduate, you want to do whatever you want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I went to the college and got a Bachelor of Science and, um, or not a Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish. And so yo hablo un poco espanol, <laughs> a little bit now, because after all these years, you forget it. So what occurred though, is that my interest though, always in high school was in math and the sciences. I loved chemistry, I loved chemistry. But dad really wanted me to go into chemistry and I was just set to do something that was different. So long story short is that I graduated, but when I graduated from college, I'd also taken an ROTC scholarship. And so I entered into the United States Army as a second lieutenant. And in the Army, and I was a military intelligence officer, and in the Army you get additional jobs. And the additional job that I had was I was assigned to nuclear, chemical, biological, defense, warfare. That is a mouthful. But that means that you study what does biological warfare do? You know, how do we protect ourselves against that, or nuclear warfare, or chemical warfare? And I learned a lot. I had to go to a school for that. The United States Army sent me to school, and I learned a lot. I loved it. I graduated as the number one student in my class, went back to my battalion, and I became the nuclear, biological, chemical warfare for my battalion. So to help guide our troops in case we were under attack with one of those, those agents, how do we protect ourselves? So I served my time in the service, got out as a captain, and then because I wanted to be, I want to be a mom. I want to be a full-time mom. And so got out of service and had a third child was a little girl named Ruth. And we had just moved into a new house. Well, not a new house. We just moved into a home that wasn't new, but it was new to us. And the, the people there before us had wanted to make sure everything was nice. And they laid a carpet. And anyway, the carpet there was an old carpet out of somebody's garage that they had put in to try to make the house look a little nicer. And it turned out that it was full of carpet beetles. And they all hatched out after we'd been there for a short time and they overran the house. And so with my background in chemical warfare, I was concerned about having an exterminator come out, but I had them come out anyway, because when you open the sock drawer, when you open the kitchen drawer, you open the beetles are crawling everywhere. It's just, you can't smash them, use fly swatters. You can't kill them fast enough. Oh. So <laughs> anyway, when I, we called the local exterminator and they came out and they and they say, you know, you leave three to the person, come back, and everything will be fine. We did that. We came home, but we all began to be sick. And then my third child at that time is 18 months old. She went into a grand mal seizure. And these are very, I mean, this is not just a little, you know, you blank out from it. I mean, these are all four limbs jerking, frothing at the mouth, eyes roll back in your head. I mean, this is an ER situation. We rushed her immediately to the local hospital. You know, she's in the grand mal seizure when we got there. They, they, they didn't know what to do, and so they said, okay, well, we have to do a spinal tap. We, they do all kinds of tests, but when you're still seizing, you can't, you can't stop, you know, that seizure. And, and normally seizures only last a short time, just a few minutes at the most. This had gone on for over an hour. Now it's an hour and 20 minutes that she's seizing in this. And finally, the ER physician said, be able to save her. She's going to die because lactic acid builds up and then you, you die because you can't continue to seize like that. And I, it's like, well, what has happened? And my, my husband, and he said, the, the, the man turned his back, the, the ER physician turned his back, Ruth is on the table in the ER room, just jerking, jerking, jerking. And, you know, she's strapped down so she doesn't fall off the examining table. And my husband and I joined hands over her. And my husband said, God, you gave her to us. You can take her home. And she stopped seizing right then. The emergency room physician whirled around because she stopped seizing. They couldn't do the spinal tap. They couldn't do any tests. They, they were giving her volume like crazy. He'd already given her the maximum amount of volume to try to bring her out of seizure because she couldn't, they couldn't do any of the tests because she's just jerking. You know, you can't stop that. And so I said, we need to run the spinal tap. We have to do the chest x-ray. Does she have pneumonia, blah, blah, blah. And they did all the tests. And they did all the tests in and they determined it was um, 
double pneumonia. Her lungs, both lungs were filled with fluid, and so that she had a febrile seizure. Her temperature was 100 degrees, which is not a high temperature, but her temperature was 100 degrees, and they didn't have any other explanation except that it was a febrile seizure, and that's what caused it. But And she had pneumonia in both lungs. I said, we just had our house sprayed for bugs. Could it be that that was what created this filling up? I said, I'm an officer. I was an officer in the United States Army. This is exactly the symptom of a nerve agent poisoning. This is what I trained my troops to see what would happen if you were exposed to a nerve agent. Your lungs would fill with fluids. You would go into seizures. And they said, no, there is no way this has anything to do with the spray. That the, the, anyway, so they sent us back home. She's on loading doses of, of a phenobarbital, which is a drug to keep you from seizing. And we're not even... Even as I already start to see the signs, the very signs I trained my troops to look for when I was in the United States Army, pinpoint pupils, slight cough, diarrhea, all those things coming back. And I thought, I know what's going to happen. She's going to go to sleep. I'm going to lay her in the crib and I will walk in an hour later and she will be dead because she won't seize because she's on the phenobarbital. She's on massive doses of phenobarbital. So she's not going to have a seizure, but she's going to be dead. And I said, I am not doing this. I'm not going to do it. And I walked out of that house and, and didn't go back. And then I started to call. And by the way, the hospital that we were in is a very good hospital in St. Louis. It's St. Louis Children's Hospital, a wonderful hospital. They do great work. But every single neurologist there, and I saw nine of them, said, Mrs. Hurd, you are barking up the wrong tree. This is not poisoning. And I said, you have got to look. Just do a chloropyrifol. Just, just check up, just check cholesterol level in the liver so we know if it was a nerve agent poison. He said, no, we're not going to do that. Anyway, so I started calling poison hotlines. I finally, and every one of them, you know, said, well, we don't know anything about this. And, you know, you get, you know, how you do this referral networking out. Finally, I got a hold of a poison hotline in Dallas. I, by the way, I'm in St. Louis. So I got a hold of a poison hotline in Dallas, Texas. And they said, you got to talk to Sheldon Wagner. You got to talk to Dr. Sheldon Wagner. He is the leading toxicologist, child toxicologist, works out in Corvallis, Washington, at the university. So I called him. Of course, all these time I'm always talking to secretaries and assistants. And I actually got to talk to Dr. Sheldon Wagner. And I explained the situation. I said, I'm afraid my little girl's been poisoned. I already called and I had called the, the exterminating company and I asked exactly what is the name of the, what the spray that you used. And guess what? It was phosphate, which has a chloropyrifos nerve agent. It was exactly what I had trained for in the United States Army. And this was happening to me here in my home, you know, just, and so he said, send me samples of the carpet, just cut them out. Send me samples of your breast milk, because I was still nursing him. Ruth was 18 months old at the time. And I sent all that, he says, send it on dry eyes, because it starts to degrade the chloropyrifos at a certain time, which I also knew. And so we sent that all off. He tested it right away because he had the labs at the university. He tested, said, I'll test it for free because the labs that I tried to get to test it in St. Louis, they wanted thousands and thousands of dollars to test for this, you know, this nerve agent in the carpet. We're dirt poor. We didn't have any money. To, you know, how am I going to do this? He said, I'll test it for free. He contacted me within just a day. He got the samples within the day he contacted me. He says, your little girl was poisoned. He said, the levels are over 100 times what they should be. Why hasn't your physician run a cholinesterate level? And I said, I tried to get them to do that. He said, give me their name. I gave him the name of the doctor. Less than an hour, I had a call from the doctor. Mrs. Hurd, would you bring your daughter in for a cholinesterate level, please? It's just a simple blood draw. The ones I had begged the hospital to do when we were there. We went in on a level. You already know the end of the story. I mean, it was positive. She'd been poisoned. And so now we're left with, we have a very, very sick little girl. There's no need to be on phenobarbital. We just can't go back to the house. Of course, we're living in a hotel room now because the whole house is covered with this spray because they sprayed every square inch of carpet because the beetles were everywhere. By the way, the beetles did die. <laughs> so did almost everybody else. So we started to see specialists, specialists in St. Louis, of course. We saw specialists in Chicago, Dallas, and they all were the same prognosis because Ruth's liver was failing. You can measure that by liver enzymes. They were extremely elevated, and her liver was failing, which is what the chloropyrifos is, what this organic aspect of this chemical would do. And I would say, well, what can we do to reverse this? There has to be a way. And they said, there is no way. And you're going to have to just resign yourself to the fact that she's going to die. She was very sick. She wouldn't eat. 
All she would do is nurse, and she's 18 months old, and everybody's got an 18 months old, you know, 18 months old, they're eating food. She wouldn't eat. She was sick. She was more than pale. She had broke out with hives, warts all over her face, all over oh. her hands, all over her arms. She was just, she just was, and every day she was fading, fading. They said, you're going to just have to resign yourself. She is, she's not willing to make it. And then there was a day I was in the specialist office. I mean, this is all happening in a short period of time. I mean, we're talking just a, a, a weeks here. You know, they gave me less than six weeks that she would live. And I'm in the specialist office in St. Louis. And he said, Mrs. Hurd, I know this is a difficult question, but we have never seen anybody die of organic phosphate poisoning before. I did deliver, you know, live liver tissue is still alive to, you know, for medical science research purposes of what liver looks like. So we like to do some liver biopsies. And that, yes, they're painful to the child. And, you know, I said, no, and goodbye. And we just walked out of the office. It's like, can anybody help me, please? No one. And so it's just like, okay, what do I do now? Just let my little girl die. Just sit and wait for the moment. She finally closes her eyes and that's her last breath. No. So I went to the Washington U. Washington University is a medical school in St. Louis. And this is this is back. We're talking in the way back in the 80s, okay? And there's still everything on microfiche. You know, there's none of this nice stuff you can just punch into the computer and do search parameters. You know, I said, listen, I have a degree in Spanish, okay? <laughs> I have some training from the United States Army, a little, you know, and their biology here. I need to learn everything. I need to learn everything I can about organophosphate poisoning and what it does to the I need to learn everything that there is. And so the librarian helped, you know, and, you know, direct me. And I spent every bit of time that I could in the library. My husband took care of my little girl at home to learn. I looked at everything, everything from the current research at the NIH and National Institutes of Health to everything there was from the snake oil remedies. I read everything and I finally thought, I need, I need to come up with a program for her because nothing, nobody had any answers. So I came up with a program that involved nutrition. She wasn't eating. So I put everything in a little, in a little uh, syringe, an oral syringe, you know, that you can feed, you know, children with, you know, you inject liquids. And so I put all the, the nutrients that I thought that were right and to help her. And a big one was, well, we can get into that later what it was, but I put in all the nutrients in there and she started to get better. And she started to get better. I, and the longer all warts were clearing up, she was looking better. And so she did recover. And I didn't, by the way, the chief administrator of St. Louis Children's Hospital did call me and apologize and said, we're sorry, the neurologist should have done the chloropyrate or the cholinesterate level. We should have done that. We weren't on that. And please, you know, we're very sorry. And, and I, I wasn't wanting to sue the hospital or anything. I'm not, you know, it's just like, you know, they were trying their best. They just didn't know how many times do people get poisoned by an organophosphate. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just didn't know. And so say they said, we're really sorry, whatever, you know. And so, and, and so I'm just this low level person just a very low level person. And so all of a sudden I started to get calls from people about, Hey, can you help me? He said, how do you even get my number? How do you even know? They said, what well, was in the St. Louis Globe Democrat? I said, what? The St. Louis Globe Democrat was a paper at the time, <laughs> you know, in, the, in St. Louis. And I said, oh, yeah, there's this little article. And so I got, the, there's just this tiny, I mean, we're talking about a paragraph. Little girl supposed to die lives. And you mentioned, and I don't even know how people got it. Nobody interviewed me. Nobody did anything. It's just this, this article in the paper, you know. And then people start to call me and say, I have this, this, and this. Or my sister has this. Or my husband has this. Or I have a child that has this. Would you help me? And he said, I don't, I don't have a degree. I don't have anything. I'm, I'm nothing. You know, I, my, my major's in Spanish, you know. And I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a healthcare professional. I am nothing. I know that. But would you do something? Because, and I said, well, I could go down and read at Wash U at the library. I'm pretty familiar with that library right now. And I could, you know, go see what I could find out. And so I would say, well, if it was me, remember, don't hold me accountable to anything. But I would do this, this, and this. And so... Then more people started to call me. And then pretty soon, Bell Telephone called me, which they had their um, main offices in St. Louis at the time, but one Bell Tower, it's a tower, it's the highest skyscraper there in St. Louis. Anyway, they called me and said, that we have hundreds of employees that are asking you to do a brown bag seminar. You know how companies do these brown bags, mm -hmm. you know, like your lunch hour, you sit and you learn about different financial options or these and different subjects and all that. And they said, they want you to come talk about health. And I said, okay, what do you want me to talk about? Well, you know, talk about general health. So, you know, I've getting all my little stuff together. I'm at the library lots now, you know, and reading. And so I give a little lecture. 
Well, then they asked me to come back. And sometimes this hall was full of 300 or more people, you know, and it was our, their best lecture. And so they keep asking me to come back. I was going back once a month to lecture at One Bell Telephone or One Bell Tower at the Southwestern Bell Telephone. And then, and then Drury Inns asked me to start doing brown bags. And then Drury Inns is a hotel chain. And then the St. Louis Catholic Parish asked me to come and start lecturing their teachers. And it just went on and on. And finally, the University of Missouri called me and said, we would like you to teach at the University of Missouri. I said, I have no degree. And they said, uh, we know that. I really need to get a degree. So then I went through and normally did my nutrition training. And that's how it all started. And since then, I have because I had all my, my undergrad work is in the arts, you know, when you get a Spanish degree, it's all in the arts. So since then, I went back to school, I did all the 10, you know, the 10 courses in chemistry, all the courses in biochemistry, all the statistics, the calculus, many semesters of calculus, all of the physics, all of the stuff you had to do so that I could get into a master's program in biochemistry. So I earned my degree and got my degree, a master's degree in biochemistry. So now I'm I have a master's of science there. And I'm also working then. I like to finish my, it's it's on the road to my PhD. I have three more years and I should finish my PhD, but everything's sort of held up right now with with um, COVID-19, nobody's doing anything. So mm-hmm. anyway, so we just, everybody hangs tight. Wow. I like to finish my PhD in biochemistry and then do what? Research. So that's how I got into it. You should just know the bottom line up. Ruth now is, she's still alive and well and she's she helps me in my office and it all turned out well but it was a horrible horrible time there are some sadnesses there because at the time this poisoning happened i was also pregnant with my fourth child and because of the poisoning i lost that baby mm. and um all of us were sick we were told that we would all die from cancer in five years none of us have died from cancer all of us would be my husband and i and then the two other children my children, Catherine and David, that were alive at the time of the poisoning, but we didn't die. We eat well, and we're still here. So that's, that's how I got into it. Right. <laughs> I was, Thank you yeah. for sharing that very personal story. Um, I mean, I've heard it now a couple of times and I am like wanting to tear up just listening to it again, even knowing the outcome. So that's very powerful. So, you know, maybe pivoting a a little bit, um, somewhat lighter, you know, one of the things that you've talked quite a bit about, and I think you alluded to this when you talked about Ruth and the nutrients that you were giving her, um, are beans, something that you like to talk about. Obviously, I want, we would love you to share kind of your overall view on nutrition and health and what specifically you gave her that you were able to heal her and your, your entire family. Um, but you're known as the bean queen. <laughs> um, yes. And so, you know, but beans can be quite controversial, obviously. There's certain dietary theories and practices like paleo and keto that, you know, avoid beans entirely. And a lot of people have side effects um, and can't digest them as well. So just love your you to dive into more of like the nutrition and healing and specifically touching on beans. In beans, and beans are the key piece in worse healing is something called soluble fiber. Soluble fiber has this ability to bind with the digestive fluid bile. It's a fiber like insoluble fiber, and all fibers cannot cross the intestinal barrier. It's just impossible. There is no fiber. You know, I have people ask me, we'll say, well, if I eat beans, well, then the beans, all that fiber will go to my baby in the breast milk. It's like, no, the f- it can't leave the gastrointestinal tract except through a bowel movement. That's the only, what goes in the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, and it leaves by the gastrointestinal tract. And so all fiber is excreted. But what is unique about soluble fiber compared to insoluble fiber is that soluble fiber is a very complex polysaccharide. It is a a, a net. It's such a, a very tiny, tight mesh of a net that it has the ability to carry molecules in the net. You know, in chemistry, we have a lot of different chemical reactions. We have ionic reactions, and we have polar covalent reactions, and we have, you know, hydrogen bonds. We have different bonds, the way we make reactions. This is different. This is actually capturing a molecule. And so it is particularly, soluble fibers, particularly good at capturing the biomolecules. Biomolecules are, are, are fat molecules. They're called micelles. And we can capture that in that 
that biomolecule in the soluble fiber because soluble fiber cannot leave the um, enter the bloodstream and has to leave via the intestinal tract, we are going to put into the toilet in the form of the bowel movement anything that is caught in the net of the soluble fiber. So what is so important about capturing bile in this net? Because bile is the trash truck for the liver. All fat on waste is excreted through the liver. And our most toxic substances, including organophosphates, what poisoned Ruth, are cleared through the liver and are placed into the digestive fluid bile. And then the bile is, goes down what are called biliary ducts and travels to your duodrum. Your duodrum is the first part of your small colon. It's just below your sternum and above your belly button. And then it travels down the bile through your jejunum to, into the ileum, but, and then it'll pass into the large colon, and then it goes through the large colon, the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid, and out. So it goes out. But there's this catch. This is what's so important. There's this catch. At the terminal part of the ileum, at the third part of the small colon, just prior to food passing into the large colon, there's a little valve there called the ileocecal valve. And on the proximal side, on the, the side before you cross in the colon, there's a very particular something that happens. And what happens is we absorb fats from the terminal part of the ileum. Well, so why is this so significant? Because bile is a fat and the substances that we're trying to get rid of that are poisonous and that create so much ill health are fat soluble. They're carried in these fats. And so we absorb our own bile. How much? 95% of bile is recycled and re-enters with all of that toxic waste back into your bloodstream. And the liver has to clear it all out again. And it goes back in as its constituent parts. And I could go into what, you know, there are triacylglycerols and it's all the different little molecules. But it still is all the toxic waste is dumped back in its complete molecular form into your bloodstream. And then we have to pull it out again, which does, puts it in digestive fluid bile, goes back down your gastrointestinal tract, and 95% of that recycles. Unless you capture the bile in the net of soluble fiber, then it is excreted. And that is how Ruth's life was saved. And so we, we start to throw away all of this toxic waste. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful system. And people who don't understand it, Ruth really was glad that you brought up, you know, there's so many people that I call it demonized beings. You know, beings are bad because they have lectins. You know, lectins are so bad for people. Oh my goodness, they are not, they're not, they're not, they're not there with the science. Lectins are they're so important to the cellular communication. For one cell to speak to another cell, we have to have a way for them to communicate. Lectins are the ligand. A ligand is um, a substance that will trigger a reaction. It's like, it's like a catalyst. And so your lectins are absolutely essential in cellular communication. Lectins are at the heart of your immune system because your immune system works by macrophages talking to T suppressor cells, or actually they talk to T helpers. The T helpers talk to the T suppressors. The T suppressors talk to, with two different lymphocytes. We have all kinds of communication going on through the white blood cells in the immune system, and lectins are critical in making this happen. So we say, well, you know, that's terrible. We can't have them because of lectins. Or, oh, you know, beans cause gas. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I want everybody out there listening. I want you to think about this. Don't have any beans. Have no beans at all. You probably don't have beans anyway because most people don't eat beans. Do you have gas? Sure you do. So if beans cause gas, but you're not eating beans, what's causing your You see, we got to get down to the real mechanism of action that is happening here. Well, the mechanism of action is it's hormones that cause gas. You say hormones? Yes, hormones are catalysts. A catalyst is a, um, is a, a substance that can trip or trigger a receptor site on a cell and then cause that cell to move into a certain action. Hormones are the primary catalyst for every chemical reaction that takes place in the human body. And without them, we would not exist. So who or what organ is responsible for clearing all your hormones out of your bloodstream? Because we make them, we make them in our endocrine glands. We also can make them like in the lining of our gut. We can make them in different places besides the endocrine glands, but most of them are made in the endocrine glands. 
And so we release these hormones and then if you have too many hormones circulate the bloodstream, you're going to get problems, lots of problems, health problems. So your liver has to clear out these hormones as they catalyze their reactions and they are cleared by the liver and placed where? In the digestive fluid bile. Hormones are very small molecules. The liver can degrade them or break them down, but it usually doesn't. You will take a complete molecule of, say, epinephrine. Epinephrine is a hormone, an adrenaline hormone. It's what gives us that fight and flight response. So you could take a molecule of epinephrine and it will go into your biofluids as what? All the breakdown carbon, hydrogen, you know, nitrogen, oxygen components. No, it goes into the bile as a epinephrine molecule. It's still potent because a catalyst, a hormonal catalyst isn't used up when it triggers a chemical reaction on a cellular site. It doesn't get used up. It just will go and trigger another reaction. All these hormones go into your digestive tract in the cells that line the lumen. The lumen is the, the space. So in these, these epithelial cells that line your gut, there are receptor sites for these hormones. And so the hormones in your biofluids then are just happily triggering chemical reactions. And the chemical reaction that they are most famous for triggering is the signal transduction pathway that causes fermentation. See, there's two ways to digest foods. We can use digestive enzymes, which is the default state of the human body. That when we make digestive enzymes in our gut, and they're really, we got lots of them, and they break down foods and we digest foods and we absorb them. That's great. But you can also break down foods through fermentation. It's just as effective. However, there's one side effect that the fermentation process has that the digestive enzyme process doesn't have. The fermentation process always has a side product, and that is gas. You cannot ferment anything without gas. Everybody knows that, okay, you want to take cabbage and make it in sauerkraut, you ferment it, and what is, get all this gas. You want to turn grapes into wine, what do you do them you, with them? You ferment them, and then you can smell the winery. I lived in Missouri for years. I mean, they had lots of wineries. You could smell them five miles away from the gas that's being produced by the fermentation of the grape. Fermentation always creates gas. So what's creating the gas? The eating of the beans? No, you don't eat beans and you have gas. What's creating the gas is your hormonal level in your gut, triggering the fermentation single transduction pathway. And once you trigger that pathway, you'll say, well, I'll have digestive enzymes. I'll just swallow a bunch of digestive enzymes because they sell them as supplements, you know, and I'll just take those. Sorry, you have to understand chemistry. When you set into play the Transduct fermentation. I don't care how many enzymes you have in your gut. Signal trans the the fermentation pathway is going to take precedence, and that's the way your food will be digested, and it is digested well, and you will absorb well. But you have the side effect of gas. So whenever you have an excess of hormones, people, when you're listening to this, just start paying attention. To when you're under more stress, when you're busier, when it's later in the day, and later in the day we are, we have hormonal pushes so we can finish the day out. You have more gas, you always have more gas in late afternoon and evening than you do earlier in the day. Or if you're really nervous because you have to do something, you have more gas. It's because you're producing more hormones because you're in this state of being busy or hormonal push because you have, you know, whatever it is you've got to get done. It's the hormones so is, that create this. Is there a way to control your body so that you have the regular digestive process and not the fermentation process? Yes, yes. What you do is you have to bring down this level of hormones that are in the bile fluids so that they're not so prolific. How do you do that? You have to interrupt this cycle of the recycling of the bile. By the way, that's called the enterohepatic recirculation, this recycling of bile that would recycle 95%. We start to throw away the bile because when you throw away the bile, those hormones are not re-entering the bloodstream at 95% to go in to cause more problems because you see the old hormones get added to the new hormones you made each day. So each day that passes, you have more and more hormones in your bile fluids that create more and more gas. So you have to bring down the overall concentration of hormones in the bile fluids. How do you do that? You got to throw away the bile. How do you throw away the bile? You have to eat soluble fiber. But the beans get the blame for gas because beans are one of the most easily fermented foods that we have. Yeah. If there are if there are a hundred girls in the room to dance with, okay, and the uh, and the girls are you know different foods that you're eating, and the, the the male partner comes in and he says, I want to dance with one of these hundred girls, and he says, I need to choose the girl that's the prettiest, you know, 
And the male person who's going to do this dance, he is actually the hormone. He is the biomolecule. It's the, the hormone in the biomolecule. The biomolecule says, hmm, I want to dance with soluble fiber because soluble fiber and bile are so attracted. They rush into each other's arms. <laughs> and they get married and there is no such word as divorce because when you make a binding with soluble fiber and a, a micelle with bile there is no that, they are captured forever and so with all the girls in the room we're going to ferment first the bean the soluble fiber because that's what's so attractive to it because in chemistry we have these negative and positive charges and then they have these attractions and, and so that's why so and there's other, there are other foods that are, you know, the second best choice. Well, we can't dance with the soluble fiber girl, with the bean girl, but we'll go dance with the cauliflower girl, or we'll dance with the broccoli girl, because then they're the next most attractive, you know? So, but it's not the food, it's the hormone. Because people who eat beans and start eating them on a regular basis, they will start to carry out these excess hormones, and then all of a sudden, they don't have gas anymore. Mm -hmm. And they're still eating beans, but they don't have gas. Well, so, yeah. So w when you talk about beans, are you talking about any bean? Are you talking about canned beans, soaked beans? Like, can you, well, what kind of beans are we talking oh, about? Oh, that's an excellent question. The beans are the, they can certainly be canned beans. They can be ones that you make at home where you take the bean, like a pinto bean, kidney bean, garbanzo bean. These are what we typically call soup beans. It's, and we soak them. We them and then you know till they're tender and put them in a pressure cooker or how we want to cook them the canned beans are just as good actually they're a little bit better than your home cooked beans unless you have a pressure cooker you know like you, some people have these instant pots great machines by the way um and then you, that's a pressure cooking system and then you will have more soluble fiber because where does soluble fiber come from always look back to the roots soluble fiber comes from insoluble fiber Soluble fiber is the breakdown product of insoluble fiber. So the more a bean is processed, the more soluble fiber it has. So, you know, in our world of, you know, health, we always say, you know, raw is better. The less cooked is better. In this case, no, the more you beat up that bean, the more soluble fiber you have because we are converting insoluble fiber to soluble fiber. And I have people ask me this all the time. Well, if I sprout, my beans, is it okay to have sprouted mung beans? No, you just converted all the soluble fiber into insoluble fiber because it can go back the other direction too. So we don't sprout the beans. And so whether you eat canned beans or um, you eat, you know, just the, the ones you make at home, like the pinto beans, I need to, to bring up a couple things about beans because some people are versus soybeans. Soybeans are, they, they're called beans, but they are not, they don't have the soluble fiber content. Soybeans in biology, we classify things with a nomenclature that indicates it's how it grows. And so because they all grow, soybeans grow the same as beans. Peanuts, by the way, which are, are ground nuts, they're also called, they grow the same way as beans. So peanuts are a legume. We call beans legume. So peanuts are a legume. Soybeans are a legume. Pinto beans are a legume. Kidney beans are a legume. Lentils are a legume. And they're all lumped into this category. But soybeans are full of oil. By the way, these are beans like the pinto and the kidney and the garbanzo. They have no oil at all, zero oil. But your soybean is so high oil content. By the way, so are peanuts. Peanuts are called a legume. They have very little soluble fiber, like the soybean, very little fiber, but they're loaded with oil, a very good oil. So there's nothing wrong with them, but they're not going to be a soluble fiber for our own purposes. So it's your traditional beans that you would put in a soup or a chili, these hard little things that you got to soak and boil. For a while to get them tender. Okay, and you mentioned lentils. Are lentils included in that category of soluble fiber? Yes, they are. They're a great source of soluble fiber. Okay. Yes. What, and what about beans? black beans? Or oh yeah, black beans are great. Black beans are absolutely great. Black beans, uh, zuki beans. Oh man, there's Crowder peas and split peas. And see, so here's something interesting: is because people get confused about peas. Peas are a vegetable, but peas can become a legume. See, like here in, in Wisconsin, like when we plant, we will harvest peas probably in late May or even early June. And so when you harvest a pea and you eat it as a vegetable, you know, a little green, you know, round thing that, you know, we think about peas, that is a vegetable. 
and it's mostly insoluble fiber. However, if you let the pea stay on the vine all the way through the summer into late fall, and then you harvest it, now you're harvesting a split pea. That split pea is a legume because all that insoluble fiber has been converted out of its vegetable state into a legume status. And it is now a bean. Interesting. Yeah. You, you know what I was thinking about when you're going on on about beans is that, I don't know if you're familiar with the blue zones and Dan Butner's work about, you know, the countries around the world and the areas of the world where people live to be the longest. And they're in every, like, I think there's a commonality of wrong among most of these regions that they eat a lot of beans and they eat less meat, but just thinking through longevity and health and the fact that these areas are eating a lot of beans, I'm guessing it goes back to what you just talked about with the soluble fiber and removing the toxins from your body, from the liver. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Yes. So, so how should someone incorporate beans into their daily life? Well, if you have no health problems, I mean, that you are aware of, everybody should be eating beans three times a day. And so you eat them at each meal because you see you're recycling your bile 24 seven. It never stops. I mean, you're dripping bile from your liver directly into the duodenum. Some of it goes um, into the gallbladder where it's stored. And when you eat a meal, then you release larger amounts of bile into the duodenum to digest that meal's contents. And so you, you have them frequently in the day. So three times a day is sufficient for, you know, the vast majority of people. And so how much should you have? A half a cup. Now that's based upon, you know, the general size of the person. If you're this little teeny tiny petite woman, if you know, five feet two and you weigh, you know, 100 pounds, it's just, or, you know, 110 pounds, you only need a third of a cup. Or if you're a child, obviously you need less. But if you're a big hunkin' man that, you know, is, you know, six feet four, you know, and weighs 230 pounds, you need to be eating two thirds cup of beans at each meal. And you just put your beans with your meal. You just and there's all oh, you can combine them with things. I mean, they don't have to be just a little pile of beans separately. They certainly can be, but you can make recipes with them. You can use bean flour. You can buy it. They have all kinds of bean noodles on the market now. They're just made with bean flour. So yes, just, and garbanzo beans, I assume, fall in that same category. Yes, they are great sources of soluble fiber. And I love how, like you mentioned, the pasta. I think for families with kids, for listeners out there with kids and families, I've been buying the chickpea and the lentil pasta now for years. And, you know, for the most part, they're good about eating it. And so that's just an easy way, especially for younger kids to get the beans in if they don't maybe like the texture or the taste of eating plain beans. Yeah. So. Yeah. So when I think about beans, like when I eat garbanzo beans and black beans, I feel like I get a stomach ache from that. So what you're saying is it's not the beans, it's something else. No, it, it could be. There's also saponins. Saponins are actually what are so easily fermented. And so when you have that fermentation process and you can have gas created, that's a very uncomfortable feeling if it's trapped. You know, you can't burp it up or you can't pass it as flatulence. And so what you do, if you get upset with the beans and you start small, instead of just saying, okay, I'm gonna eat my whole half cup or a third cup or whatever, you just say, I'm just going to start with a teaspoon of beans at each meal. You're not going to get a sick stomach from a teaspoon of beans. Mm-hmm. And then when you say, I didn't have any gut problems with that. Yeah. Okay, now go to two oh. teaspoons of beans with each meal. And then what you do is you start to carry out little bits of all these hormones that are creating this reaction of fermentation. And then you're able to work up to it eventually till you get to your, your serving size. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that's awesome. Um, so you touched a little bit about hormones when you were getting into this whole soluble fiber and beans and getting rid of the toxins. Uh, One topic we want to dive into a little bit more is hormones, particularly with women, women's hormone health. And, you know, it seems like within our sort of age range, a lot of people talk about hormones and then being out of balance. And then there's a lot of women that are, you know, perimenopause or they in that range where they're approaching menopause. And also even just thinking about like teenage girls and what can we be doing, you know, preventatively. And if you're in the situation where you know your hormones are out of balance and you have significant symptoms, PMS and the hot flashes and acne, all that kind of good stuff. Just your thoughts on that area. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This is a very, you know, I wish there was a simple, just do this one thing, eat beans. Beans are certainly important, but there are, there are many factors that come in. And so you need a, an overall good diet. You know, like I had these e-courses and then I cover every single one of the aspects. For instance, I've talked to you about soluble fiber. Let's just look at something else that is impacting 
hormonal health so we get the full effect of this. Let's say you love sugar. And by the way, if you said there was one particular thing that a person could do, would I say it be to eat beans? No, it's to cut out your sugar. That will do more for you than any other thing as far as hormonal health. You'd be astounded. Why? Because when we eat sugar, it goes into the bloodstream and you have an immediate and rapid rise in blood glucose. Sugar is very easily digested and absorbed. We're talking about in seconds, it enters into the bloodstream. And then when your sugar spikes, your body goes into a panic because if it goes up, continues to go up as quickly as it's going up, you will go into a state called diabetic coma, which is fatal and you can die. So your body is built in these fail safes. So then you will release a large amount of insulin to bring your blood sugar down. When you bring your blood sugar down, then we're not going to be in any danger of diabetic coma. Now, I want to stop and point out, it's the rate of increase that's so important because you can be within the normal levels. Normal blood sugar is 70 to 100. You can be within the normal blood sugar, but you're spiking so quickly. And I'm talking about your body not responding in 10 minutes or five minutes. We're talking about in seconds, we have this response. So the blood sugar is shooting up because you ate sugar. So now we have to release a large amount of insulin to bring it down. How much insulin do you release? It depends on what your spike is. If your spike is particularly steep, then you release a large amount of insulin. Oh, great. Well, insulin is working for us. The insulin brings down the blood sugar. Hooray, hooray, day is saved. We're not going to go into any diabetic coma. However, because you release so much, it's a knee-jerk reaction. And in this knee reaction, reaction, we got so much of this insulin release. Now your sugars are slamming down so quickly that you're going to have the opposite problem. You're going to go into insulin shock, which is also fatal. Well, insulin shock means there's not enough blood glucose to be able to fuel your brain. Your brain runs on blood glucose primarily as a fuel. Without blood glucose, your brain will shut down. If your brain shuts down, you're dead. Okay, so that's insulin shock. So now your blood sugars are coming down so fast and it's a rate of decrease that your body goes, oh no, we have to have sugar and we got to get more blood glucose. So what do we do? We do. We release a hormone. Okay, people, we're back to hormones. We release a hormone to create gluconeogenesis. A hormone, the name of this hormone is epinephrine and norepinephrine, primarily norepinephrine, but both of them are involved. Adrenaline, you will have an adrenaline rush. You know, people eat sugar so they can get an adrenaline rush because this is the reaction that will happen. You get your adrenaline rush, you have your fight and flight hormone, you have the energy and you have the brain power and you are right there and on task. You are great, you know, this is fantastic. Okay, you know, everybody loves to live on adrenaline and you have the adrenaline rush to do what? To be able to put sugar back into your bloodstream because the adrenaline triggers a process in your liver that's called gluconeogenesis, gluco for sugar, neo for new, genesis for creation, the creation of new sugar, gluconeogenesis. It has to be catalyzed by a hormone. The hormone is adrenaline. That's epinephrine and norepinephrine. And so then you trigger the liver to make sugar. Why do we have to make sugar to put it in the stream? Because you're coming down so low. Why is it coming down so low? Because it's got so high because you ate sugar. And so you have this cascade of reactions. Oh, and I'm not done yet. This is just the beginning of what happens as far as chemical reactions in the human body. Okay, so now we have this large release of insulin and we are now producing more sugar because now let's go and see what happened to all the sugar that was in the bloodstream. Where did it go? What happened? You know, insulin was released, but what did the insulin do with the sugar? Uh, what do we do with it? Just, you know, go poof and it disappears? No, matter's neither created nor destroyed. We have to, it goes into something, something happened to it, some chemical reaction happened. What is the insulin doing to the sugar? The insulin converted it into a triacylglycerol. Well, what's a triacylglycerol? It's a fat cell. And you'll say, well, I knew eating sugar makes me fat. Oh, well, yeah, we all got that. I mean, that's the bottom line. But it's deeper than that, people. It's deeper than that. So we convert this into a fat fat cell. All the sugar that you ate is going to convert it by into the fat cell. So what do we do with the fat cell? This is just float around your bloodstream. Some of it will. Triacylglycerol is the same as the triglyceride. And pe most people know the word triglyceride is part of your cholesterol readings. And so but we're going to call it what it is. It's a triacylglycerol. And then we store it. We store these. Some of them in bloodstream, but the vast majority are going to be stuck into a cell called an adipose tissue cell. Adipose tissue is just a code word for fat cell. We're going to dump all these sugar molecules that have been converted into triacylglycerols into a fat cell. 
Okay, good. So we get fat. We got fat cells. Uh, and it's more than that. Whenever you deposit a triacylglycerol into adipose tissue, you trigger the production of an adipokine. What is an adipokine? It's what causes inflammation. One of the causes, major causes of inflammation. So we have just created an inflammatory by eating sugar. What does that do? It gives us all kinds of symptoms. And so it, it, it is so in depth. So, you know, there's so many things to do. This is just like the little parts. So that if we were just eating well across the board, not eating sugar and doing all the right things we're supposed to do, including our beans, and there's more. I mean, I, there's so many pieces. That's what I got covered in all my courses. That's why these courses are so long. Because, you know, I go into each one of these things, you know, these, I got to talk about also fats and you got to also talk about, you know, the other nutrients. There's lots of stuff involved. So, but when you eat just a diet of food, Food has all the nutrients that you need, and you stay away from things that we know that are bad, like sugar, and there's some other things too, but then you don't have this reaction, and then you don't have these PMS symptoms, you know? You don't have the, the hot flashes and the, 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 the teenage girl that's, you know, puberty, and she can't even go to school today because she's got such horrible cramping and all. This is so reversible. And so the key ingredient, though, it's beans are certainly important, but it is drop that sugar like a hot potato. Yeah. So, and, you know, question is, about uh, that. Oh, I I was just going to ask quickly. Um, when you're talking about sugar, you're ta I'm assuming you're talking about processed sugar. You're not talking about the natural sugar in fruits. But can you clarify that? I am so glad you asked. It's not an answer that anybody wants to hear. It includes all sugars. It doesn't matter if it's honey, molasses, um, maple syrup. It all is converted into blood glucose, including fructose. Fructose is the fruit sugar. So if we're eating fruit, say, well, I'm doing a healthy thing. I'm going to have, you know, whatever fruit for breakfast. Or that is going to rid blood glucose love just to see the donut. And then you set into play this whole cascade of chemical reactions. So that's hard for people to hear because, it, you know, we always go back and, you know, we know we, all the food pyramids, which have undergone many, many changes in the past, even just decade and a half, you know, that fruit and vegetables, and it's always said that way, it's never vegetables and fruits, it's fruits and vegetables are so good for you because they have all these nutrients. They do have a lot of vitamin content and a lot of good nutrients, but the fruits come with a lot of sugar. In a typical example, it depends on what you're comparing. But your vegetables have three times more nutrients than fruits do with 10 times less sugar. So your vegetables are the way to go. We want to get our nutrients from our vegetables so we don't have that spike in blood glucose that create all kinds of other problems. Yeah, you know, allowing fruit and thinking of people just like kind of practical tips, you know, for someone who's eating a lot of not only fruit, but just processed sugar, or maybe their kids are eating a lot of processed sugar. What are just some simple steps to take without kind of all or nothing? Because, you know, some people, if you tell them to, you know, try incorporating beans, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that's going to be just too much for them to start. Mm -hmm. What are your, what are your so, tips to try to incorporate some food and, you know, even just lifestyle? Yeah, it's, it's to begin. Some people like to just grab the bull by the horns and just do everything, which is great. Um, at least you can start and cut back on your sugars and eat less and then eventually eat even less than that. Um, there is a problem when you look at sugars. I mean, I wish that it wasn't true, but it is true. Sugar is a substance. So it's hard. It's, it is like alcohol that, you know, like an alcoholic, you know, they'll call themselves an alcoholic even if they haven't had a drink in 22 years. They are called recovering alcoholics because they know if they have one drink that it just leads to another and another and another. Sugar is the same. Um, it is actually more addictive than cocaine and heroin. We've done many studies now to look at the addictive qualities of sugar compared to like cocaine and heroin. And we, you know, we use lab rats and we addict them to cocaine or heroin. And then we give them a choice of having sugar. It's usually within two days they've converted to sugar over their cocaine. They would rather have sugar than cocaine or rather have sugar over your heroin. And we've tried it with fructose too, where we feed them fruit. In two days, they want fruit more than they want cocaine or heroin. Why? Because of the sugar.
that blood glucose increase gives us increase of dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical in our brain. It's a neurotransmitter that gives us a sense of pleasure. It's extremely, and so we always want it again. So as we are looking at our diets and saying, well, yeah, we can cut back on sugar. That's good. You're going to crave sugar. You're going to crave it like no tomorrow. So personally, I see the best route is to go about it a different way. It's just say, we just say we're not going to have sugar in anymore. It's gone. No more desserts. And what will we do instead? Make rewards for adults. We can, well, sometimes adults have problems with it too, but for kids, it's really easy. <laughs> um, you, you do a reward system. I work with oh, thousands and thousands of kids that have serious health problems. And we just have to say, we're dropping sugar like a hot potato. It's just gone because it's creating so many of their problems. And so I just say, come up with a reward system. And the reward has to be lucrative enough. The carrot has to be big enough that they will go for it. Whether it's a little child who's trying to work for a stuffed animal or if it's a teenager who really wants his own cell phone, you know? And so you say, hey, you this way, then you will earn a cell phone after, you know, so many days of eating this way or so many, you know, points per meal. You can set up whatever system you want. And this is something that's really important with children and teens. Never make food a battleground because you will lose. You will always lose. You shouldn't be mad. You shouldn't be eating that. That was very bad. You're going to be punished. You know, you're, we're taking away your phone privileges. Blah, blah. No, don't do that. You want, you want them on your side. You just say, okay, you didn't eat right. You ate something you shouldn't. You know, we're all suffering from it because we see how irritable you are. And, you know, because there's always side, immediate side effects of eating sugar. And you just say, well, you know, there's no point today. And I think you are, I see you're 11 points away from earning that. You wanted to go to Bruce Mountain to go skiing, you know, with your friend as part of a family trip and you can bring your friend, you want to do that, you're 11 points away. There's no point for this meal because, you know, you, you ate whatever. And it didn't reach our goal yet. And so then the person, the child, the teenager, or we can do it for ourselves, for an adult, set up your own reward program. You know, when I get so many points, I'm going to go treat myself to whatever, but not treat yourself to food, treat yourself to, you know, a new outfit or, you know, a trip to wherever you want to go or something like that. So, we, we, we have to just remember this addictive quality of sugar because that's, that's why we are sugar addicts. The consumption of sugar in the United States hasn't gotten lower and lower through the years. It just always is going higher and higher and higher. Yeah. Well, and I'm Marty assuming and I, that includes, sorry, go ahead, Stephanie. No, I mean, Marty and I couldn't agree with you more. We talk a lot about this topic yeah. um, with people. I think it's great for, um, for our listeners to hear it again and in such in such detail. And, you know, I don't know if another component of all this, because all this is interrelated, you know, we talked about hormones, but mental health and anxiety and the role that food and nutrients play on our mood and depression. And I know you do all these e-courses, which we will link up all this information in our show notes. For our listeners to find, you have a wide range. Um, and like you said, you really dive deep into these areas much more for people to learn and heal but I love your thoughts on the role that food plays. And especially with mental health, I think what's going on right now, we're recording this during Corona and stay at home. And, you know, a lot of people out there say, you know, yes, this is obviously very tragic and there's a lot of health issues and, and deaths, but like the aftermath from a mental health standpoint is going to be just as um, potentially um, just as damaging as the physical um, health implications of getting the virus, right? Right, right. What we eat has everything to do with our mental health. Mental health is driven by neurotransmitters. They're, uh, chemists, they're hormones. We're back to hormones. They're hormones that are going to carry electrical messages. They're called action potentials from one brain cell to another brain cell to enable thought, mood, um, our, just our whole overall mental health status. And these hormones, they're made in the brain at, at the neuron itself. They're, it's at the, at the end of a, of a neural fiber that's connecting to the other, at the end of the axon and the dendrite. And we release these neurotransmitters. But what most people don't realize is that we have some non-neural sources of neurotransmitters. Non-neural means not made in the brain. It's made in other places. The primary hormone that impacts mental health is epinephrine and norepinephrine. They are at huge quantities in our brain. Where do we make them? Certainly we can make them. 
much more than the pain, but the vast majority are coming from your adrenal glands. They're the glands that are stimulated with sugar. They're the glands that get so much or stimulated with all kinds of other substances too. And they will pour out this large amount of these hormones. Like when we have that sugar reaction, they're poured out so we can kick in the process of gluconeogenesis. And so as that happens, because epinephrine and norepinephrine can enter via the hype, there's a, a pituitary hypothalamus axis, the uh, hypothalamus is part of the brain. And so there's a blood brain barrier that normally keeps things from just entering the blood. Things just can't go to the brain because the brain has to be protected. You have to have a certain doorway. These hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, they have a door thrown wide open for them. They can enter through that pituitary hypothalamus axis. And so they enter in and then they act as neurotransmitters. If you have too much of that hormone there, you'll have, you will trigger receptor sites. And then it depends we have hip or excitatory receptor sites, and it depends on how many you trigger. There's a sum total that you, it's just a simple math and you just calculate it. But you can have be really depressed from eating sugar, or you can get really excited from eating sugar. And so it has a direct impact. And then there's also this bad thing about well, there's glucoreceptors on our neurons. Our neurons are our brain cells. And when you trigger glucoreceptor over and over and over again, glucoreceptors are triggered by sugar. Because your sugar is going to the brain. If you have too much sugar, then you overstimulate the glucoreceptor. And that also creates a bad reaction, also causes a deterioration of the neuron, which is not good because that you destroy a neuron, it's forever destroyed. Other cells go through a mitosis. That means you can a cell dies, it can be replaced. If you kill a neuron, there is no replacement. It's just gone. And so then we go into some really bad mental health problems. So, so, so your, so your number one tip, it sounds like would be to cut out sugar. Am I hearing that right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Most of that cut off I heard was curing that. Uh, nope. I said your number one tip would be oh. to cut out sugar yes. across the board in terms of hormone health, in terms of yes. mental health. And, yes. and then maybe yes. step two would be adding in the beans. <laughs> yes. Yes, Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If people could only do one thing in their whole life, it's cut out your sugar. You will be astounded what it will do for you. Astounded. And don't ever do say, oh, it's okay once a week or it's okay once a month or on my birthday. No, because then you start the whole craving again. You're the alcoholic and you have a glass of wine and now you just have to fight all the cravings again. Don't put yourself through that. Once you get over the withdrawal, it is a two-week withdrawal from sugar. Oh, and you're going to want it. And then some people will be over that craving for it after a few weeks. Some is three months, some is three years. Some say, don't touch it. Don't touch it. It'll only tear you down. Yeah. I have to ask you, do you ever eat sugar? Never. 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 No. Never. Never. Do I eat fruit? Never. Ever. Never. Wow. Wow. I am 62 years old. I'll be 63 this year. I have a lot of work to do. The uh, average lifespan in the United States for a woman is in her late 70s. You know, that's only going to give me another 15 years top, supposedly. No people, I'm going to shoot way past that. Did you know that we can actually live for 120 years? There's these end caps. They're on the end of our chromosome are called telomeres. The chromosomes are these twisted strands of DNA, and there's a cap. And every time a cell goes through a mitotic event, that means it dies off and it's replaced by another DNA. But every time that happens that you're copying that DNA, then the telomere gets a little shorter and a little shorter and a little shorter and a little shorter. And once the telomere disappears completely off of the chromosome, then that cell cannot regenerate. You will not have a mitotic event. And so then we die. When we look at the telomeres on the different cells, we know that there is enough telomere that you could live 120 years. Hmm. Why don't we? Because we kill off cells too early through all these processes, these chemical processes that I've even just begun to touch on today. And so then we have to go through a mitotic event sooner. And so then your telomeres get shorter and shorter sooner than they should. So, if I want to live to 120, sugar is not a part of that picture. Fruit is not a part of that picture. So and obviously then alcohol and wine isn't either, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah. No. They try triacylglycerols in less than that triacylglycerol. 
Yeah. Yeah. Which I think even during this time right now, I think sugar and alcohol consumption are probably even higher than yes. normal. Um, and I'll even speak for myself a little bit of someone who doesn't eat much of it, but it's, it's even more challenging during this day at home. <laughs> It, it is because these things actually make us feel better. We're self-medicating. Mm -hmm. Whether we use sugar or alcohol or nicotine or whatever substance we use or we're taking a medication because that's just what our medications do, all of our selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and all of the antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds, all of those, they're trying to alter the hormonal balance in the brain of the neurotransmitters. Well, that's what we're doing when we eat sugar, drink alcohol, do caffeine, whatever, you know, whatever we're doing. And so we're just trying to self-medicate. But if you eat well, oh, people, if you're eating well, it doesn't matter if it was COVID-19 or whatever situation you're in, you handle it well. You, you, you can handle the situations without turning to a substance to be able to get this because you're so healthy. You already make what you're supposed to make in an exactly the right amount for just that situation. Our bodies are marvelous, just marvelous in what they can do. But we got to give them a chance but we overstep our bounds. We always like to step in and make things try to happen our way in our, our time <laughs> as typical human beings, you know? <laughs> yeah. So if one of your kids, you know, I, I'm assuming they're older now, but let's say in their teenage years, you know, they were feeling sick, had a fever, run down, or even menstrual cramps or whatever, would you say cut out the sugar? <laughs> like, Yes. Yes. Yes, I would if that was my kids. And so my kids, when they were growing up, I did not feed them sugar. I mean, did they have sugar? They were friends, and they would have it, and then they come home with a headache, and they'd be sick or whatever, you know. But they have to learn. You know, was I mad at them? No. Everybody's got to learn, you know. And so, but yes, if a person is sick, when you eat sugar, when you are sick, it lowers your immune system function for up to 50%. And it's just like, that's the worst thing you could do for a person when they're sick because you want to build their immune system, not to bring her down. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but see what we do is when somebody's sick, oh, honey, you can have whatever you want to eat. All you want are popsicles. You have popsicles. It's just like, no, no, we'll do something together. Mommy will, you know, if they're small children, mommy will sit down and we will read a book together. Or if they're older teens, you'll say, let's just sit and whatever you do with an older teen, you know, you know, talk together or most of them just want more screen time. So mm -hmm. you just give them more screen time. Yeah. You know, like my kids were growing up, they were limited on screen time. You know, they only got so much time. You know, kids will stare on the computer or on their cell phone or whatever they got, you know, your iPad. And so I would limit the time. And so my kids were always, Mom, how can I earn more screen time? Well, the microwave needs to be cleaned or, you know, the oven needs to be clean or something needs to be clean. You want to do something, you can get some more screen time, you know, you, you, you work for it, you know? So, yeah. Because they were already eating them. So, yeah. Yeah. So, totally switching gears a little bit here. Um, Karen, what do you do for fun? I saw on your website that you're the executive producer of Seen and Heard Productions. I am. I am. That is my fun. That is my fun. I am a producer. I'm a writer. And so I write historical fiction. I write a lot of stuff. I'm writing a sci-fi, a sci-fi um, sci um, fantasy novel now. But anyway, I have been writing for a long time. I've written many, many plays. I've been writing a local column on historical fiction. It's a story. It's, you know, based in history, but it's a fictional story. And I've been writing that a weekly column in a local newspaper here and I am a screenwriter and I wrote a, a, a feature film called The Lumber Baron and it is out there you can go you know Amazon or wherever you want to YouTube or, you know Voodoo Hulu you know there's there's all those <laughs> things and you can and you can watch it and so I wrote that and then yeah I produced it and I'm planning on producing uh, many, many more. And that's fun. Oh, I love being on set. I love writing and telling a story and making it come alive. And yeah, that's my fun. How do you have time to do all of this is what I want to know. <laughs> that's what I was wondering. I'm like, do you sleep? I mean, <laughs> no, I do sleep. I have been eating well for a long time. I just, I wish, sometimes I just wish that people could feel the way I felt for just one day. Just feel what it feels like to live in Karen Hurd's body for one day. Because I have been eating right, not for one year, two, 
two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, decades, decades I've been eating right. I feel so wonderful. I have so much energy. I just, it's just like you get things done in a shorter amount of time because you're so clearly focused. Your mind is sharp. You're right there. You did it. You know, everything is easier for you. You're not having to beat your brain. You know, trying, how do I figure this out? No, you already got it. You just got it. And you're just on it and you just go and do and you have all this tremendous energy. And it's just wonderful to feel that way. And how did I get there? I got there by eating well, not taking any supplements, not doing any special, just eating good food and staying away from the bad foods. That's all I have done. And so I don't color my hair. I'm not wearing makeup today. I know that this is a, a podcast. So nobody's going to see me. But I mean, and my hair is, this is it, you know, and, and this I'm, and I'm, you know, in my 60s and I feel fabulous. I do more than 20 year olds do. I, you know, I'm just involved in life and it's because you feel so well. I want everybody to feel that way and they can. It's within their grasp. And it's not that you have to have a lot of money or anything like that. It's just simple things. Just eat the right things and avoid the wrong things. And you, and I know you have a number of e-courses that, you know, go into a lot more detail about, you know, different protocols and different, you know, health issues. And can you tell us how our listeners can find you and find your e-courses? Sure. Um, You go to my website. My website is karenherd.com. So my name, Karen Herd, and Herd is spelled H-U-R-D, and Karen is traditional spelling, K-A-R-E-N-H-U-R-D. Dot com, And you go to that website and then on the landing page, you're going to say, see a little button, explore our e-courses. You click on that and then you can go to all the different courses that are offered. And then each course gives you a sense of what this course is about. You can watch a little introduction from me about what the course is about without buying the course. You know, you can just watch it and see, oh, this is talking about diabetes or this course is talking about premenstrual syndrome or, you know, uterine fibroids or this course is talking about arthritis or, you know, there's all kinds of courses out there that I have or this one's on general health. So, and then you just click on the buttons and people are usually computer, you know, savvy and they just go through and you click on the buttons and then you get registered and enrolled in the course. Hey, I'm excited. I, Stephanie and I were talking about purchasing a couple of the courses. We're excited to go through them and learn more about your specific protocols. Yeah. yeah. And we understand that you're offering our listeners a um, special protocol for preventative measures and action steps you can take if you contract coronavirus. Yeah, COVID-19, and I actually put the protocol up there, it's for free. So if you go to the landing page, you can scroll down and go to the menu and just say, click on COVID-19. And I have just put that out there just for just people. I mean, just, we need to do this. We Mm -hmm. we just need to do these things, you know. And if they're simple things, doesn't involve any money. I had a a group contact me from a a country in Eastern Africa because they're very, very poor there. And they, they, one of my people had shared that and they said, could we translate this into Swahili to give to all our clinic workers here that are in our organization? Because because they're so poor, because the whole COVID-19 is basically, I talk a lot about heat and it's a very, COVID-19 is very susceptible by heat. So all we have to do is just increase our body temperature, even just a part degree. And anyway, so I, it's something that the, these African people can do because they don't have, they don't even have any food to eat. But if they can get warm and stand by the fire, you can knock out COVID-19 like crazy. So that's the protocol. So I just put that out there for everybody. Just do this, people. Stay well. Do it. Yeah. Well, that's great. And that's such an amazing feeling for you, I'm sure, to be able to impact people around the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. When they contact me, said, can we translate to Swahili? I said, yes, translate in any language. Get it to the clinic workers. Get it to these people. They don't have to die. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. As we wrap up, we like to ask all of our guests um, a question. What does the art of living well mean to you? The art of living well is to keep this in mind at the forefront that food has the power to kill, but food has the power to heal. So we make our food choices. Will we make the food choices to kill? Or will we make the food choices to heal? That is what drives me. That is the art of living well. 
make the right choice. Very powerful words. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Karen. You're welcome. Oh, I have enjoyed you ladies so much. I love you too. Yeah, well, we'll have to have you on again. Yes, I, I have so many more questions I, I would love to ask you. I, we definitely want to have you on again. Oh, yeah. I will. Yeah, whenever you want me on, just tell me. I'm very happy to come on. Yeah. yeah. I Thank love what you guys are doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Love it. The one thing I'll just say for our listeners, they can go find it on your website, but you mentioned your hair. So yeah. Karen does not have gray hair. If she does, I can't see it. I probably have more gray hair than her right now because I haven't had it colored, but she has a whole protocol about not only reversing gray hair, but also growing hair. So if you have fine wheat thinning or you've lost your hair, if you have alopecia or another autoimmune. Um, so highly recommend that. And we will mention that in the show notes. So. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much. Take care, Karen. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. We are so excited that we created these fabulous new products for our listeners to support our podcast. Yeah, we have two new recipe books and one is curated for families. So there's lots of family friendly recipes that both kids and adults will love. I've made these recipes for my family and everyone enjoys them. And then we have a second recipe book for those that want plant-based foods and maybe you're already eating vegan or maybe you're just trying to incorporate more vegetables and plants into your diet. They both have shopping lists and they're made with ingredients that you can find at almost any grocery store. You don't need to go to like a specialty store to find these ingredients. And we also created a Minneapolis Healthy Restaurant Guide and we're really excited about it. We want to support our local restaurants and um, it's really meant for you to find little gems in town that maybe you didn't know about. It gives you a chance to eat healthy out in a restaurant. Um, the food is delicious at these places. They're sourcing local sustainable foods and we're just really excited to support our local healthy restaurant community. And then the last product that we created is our favorite Art of Living Well podcast water bottle. It's 24 ounces. You may have heard us talk about this on stories um, because it serves both hot and cold beverages. There's a straw. You can use it or use it without the straw. And it's perfect for on the go, at home, wherever, and it'll help keep you hydrated. So we'd love for you to try our products and support our podcast. As our listeners, you can head on over to our website, which is www.theartoflivingwell.us slash products and order yours today. Maybe even give one as a gift. And also just to let you know, we priced all of these products um, pretty low so that everybody could enjoy them. $7 per guide, $20 for the water bottle, and we'd love your support. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook, where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.